war. I'm reading from the provost's call for proposal submissions for this year's Diversity, Equity, Inclusion Week. Today is the last day of the fifth year that the university is marking or celebrating diversity, equity, and inclusion. I'm Salpi Lazarian. I'm the director of the USC Dornsif Institute of Armenian Studies. And we're grateful to the DEI Week team for linking such violence to each other, whether the violence is national or global. And in doing so, we're acknowledging that it is the absence of diversity, equity, and inclusion that results in these social and political tensions in our lives, regardless of where we live. Today, we've invited the preeminent historian of the Caucasus region, the area of the Nagorno-Karabakh War, together with an ambassador and scholars and students of human rights, psychology, and literature to talk about this war that came to Los Angeles. In many ways, it's no different from the torture killings and revolutions and violence of Central America that come to Los Angeles, or the Myanmar crackdowns that have come to Los Angeles, or the fighting in Yemen or Ethiopia that comes to Los Angeles. The Galapag Artsakh War also came to Los Angeles at a time when there were several wars going on here in LA and throughout the US and within. That's what we were doing throughout 2020, from Ahmaud Arbery to Breonna Taylor to George Floyd, all the way to Portland and Kenosha and Minneapolis and Los Angeles. At that same time, Armenians in Gharapal, who had four decades under Soviet rule and three, three decades in the post-Soviet period, demanded the protection of their own basic and civil rights, basic human and civil rights. That population was attacked in 2020 by two powerful military forces, Azerbaijan, the autocratic state that claims sovereignty over them, and Turkey, NATO's second largest army. The result was a complete military victory following 45 days of the most intense military assault against military and civilian targets, a complete military victory for Azerbaijan. That war came to Los Angeles. This is the largest concentration of Armenians in any city outside Armenia. And everyone is somehow related and connected. So the urgency of the situation and the immensity of the loss was personal and severe. Ironically, Armenians' calls for independence from Azerbaijan started specifically because of the absence of equity and inclusion for the Armenian population of Azerbaijan. Today, in the aftermath of the war, public statements and actions continue to preclude equity and inclusion. So today we've invited a wide variety of scholars and students from within and outside USC to address the many aspects of this distant but immediate war from human rights to recycled trauma to identity. This is how we've structured today's program. In the first half, I will invite three special guests to join me in discussing the first part of this dilemma, human rights and their absence and what to do in the case of ensuing violence. When our 35 minutes is over, we will turn the program over to my colleague, Dr. Shushan Garabedian, the deputy director of the Institute, who will continue the conversation with three new guests, Professor Beth Meyerowitz of the psychology department at SC, Professor Lilit Keshishan of the writing program at SC, and Maral Tavitian, a second year student at USC Gould School of Law. But first, to help set the stage and help us understand the specific and the global context of the nagorno karabakh War, my first guest, I'd like to welcome Professor Ronald Grigor Suni. Thank you, Salpi. Hi, Ron. It's good to see you again. And uh, greetings to all the guests that you've assembled. Thank you. It's good to see you. Let me do a very brief introduction of you. Um, it could very easily be a very long introduction, but let me do the brief version. Professor Ronald Suni teaches history and poli sci at the University of Michigan, and he is Emeritus Professor of Political Science and History at the University of Chicago. His intellectual interests and many, many published works have centered on the non-Russian nationalities of the Russian Empire and the Soviet Union, particularly those of the South Caucasus, Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Georgia. 
His works revolve around questions of nationalities, nationalism, and nation making. His most recent book is Stalin, Passage to Revolutionary. And the book he's currently working on has a very intriguing title, Forging the Nation, The Making and Faking of Nationalisms. Um, Ron, before I introduce the panel, we have just a few minutes to ask you to help us place this conflict in sort of three contexts, empire and empires, the geopolitical significance of this war, the way it was raged, the extent of the disparity and the gains and the losses, but very first in the context of human rights. What was it that the people of Guadalajara wanted in the days of the collapsing USSR and what do they want today? That's an easy question to start with, right? Thank you again, Salpi. Yes, so Salpi wrote to me and said, I'd like you to talk about the history of the conflict in the context and from the perspective of human rights. I'll try. <laughs> early 20th century conflict, Soviet era social and economic inequities, the 1990s war, the second war, the human and civil rights issues that remain unaddressed, unresolved. And then she concluded, I'll give you a solid uninterrupted, except by me, 12 to 15 minutes. So, Patronora Galem, Im Sireli Salpi. So, to begin. It is a pleasure to be able to address this topic. And it's a, in some ways uh, a difficult moment to address it because of the recent tragedy that Armenians suffered. But I'm gonna go back, I'm a historian, so into the Soviet period and talk about the way in which the Karabakh conflict began or at least was set up by Lenin's nationality policy. Those of you who've studied the Soviet Union or hopefully read some of my books will know that the Leninist policy was to give autonomy to some degree to various Soviet peoples. Let them enjoy their language, give them alphabets if they needed it, uh, a degree of autonomy, allow a certain cultural nationalism, some local autonomy in decision-making, but without real full political sovereignty. Whatever it said in the constitution, these were not sovereign states within the Soviet Union. The Armenian Soviet Socialist Republic was one of 15 under the dominance of Moscow. This was, as Salpi put it, an empire, uneven empire dominated by the Central Communist Party. Now within that, Karabakh was a kind of exception. It was an autonomous region within Azerbaijan even though its overwhelming majority of the population, 90% when it joined, 75% by the time of the conflict in the 90s, uh, Karabakh was an exception in that it really never had any autonomy. Uh, there was some cultural development of Armenians there, but it was always limited by Baku. And Karabakhsis knew well as they were losing their language and uh, uh, felt discriminated against, not fully enjoying even national rights as supposedly guaranteed by the Leninist of, of ideology. They knew that they were living maybe better than most Azerbaijanis, but far inferior to those of their compatriots across the border in the Armenian Soviet Republic, the Hayastansis. So a conflict smoldered for decades. I remember first turning to this conflict in the 1970s when a few Armenian intellectuals actually wrote a petition and tried to get Karabakh moved from Azerbaijan, where it was only a few miles from the border with Armenia into the Armenian Republic, but the Soviet government refused to do that. So smoldering conflict that then exploded, raged forth in 1998 uh, with the coming of the Gorbachev reforms, Pedestroika and Glasnost. Now you are allowed to express yourself more freely. And the Armenians, of course, who have a trouble keeping their mouths shut anyway, usually, in fact, did that in a very dynamic way. Millions, you know, hundreds of thousands, if not a million people came out into the streets, first in Stepanakert, the capital of Karabakh, and later in the streets of Yerevan, calling for the joining of Karabakh with Armenia, which only resulted in a horrendous pogrom, a, a massacre of Armenians in the little town, in the industrial town of Sumgayit, within Karabakh, within uh, Azerbaijan. And later this was followed by other uh, struggles and conflicts back and forth, uh, 
the black January of January 1990, when attacks on Armenians continued in Baku, the capital of Azerbaijan, which led finally uh, during this conflict before independence of either republic to an exchange of populations. Armenians fled from Azerbaijan to Armenia and other parts of the former Soviet Union and even abroad. And Azerbaijanis were basically deported uh, uh, largely peacefully, but in trucks and forcefully to Azerbaijan where they became refugees. So we have a human rights conflict. We have a human rights uh, a disaster on both sides of the frontier. There are, of course, no purely innocent sides in any war. At one point or another, some people are victims. Victims can become perpetrators. Perpetrators can come, become victims. And if you study this conflict uh, uh, earlier, if you think about events like Kelbajar, where our Azerbaijanis were killed, uh, there, there are events that each side will call, and they do this frequently, a genocide. There was no genocide in this war, but there was a frame, a lens, through which each side came to understand the conflict. And the very word genocide, such a powerful term in international discourse, of course, precludes certain kinds of negotiation, certain kinds of accommodation, certain kinds of compromise. And if you went to Armenia during the time after 1994, the armistice that the Russians uh, uh, brokered in this area, when the Armenians were victorious, and when they occupied a good part of Azerbaijan inside and outside of Karabakh, you would have met a, a population and a leadership that was generally not willing to compromise. And of course, it was very difficult to compromise because on the other side, the Azerbaijanis who had been defeated were unwilling to give up Karabakh or their own claims. So this grew into a war between two newly independent nation states, Armenia and Azerbaijan, and with a third actor, the Autonomous Republic of Mountainous Karabakh. Now, bringing this to the question of human rights, we have here a deep conflict between two principles. On the one hand, the Wilsonian or Leninist principle that was in fact guaranteed by the Soviets supposedly of national self-determination. An ethnic or national uh, cultural population has the right to rule itself, to have representation and protect its civil, human and cultural rights. But that conflict of national self-determination came after, particularly after the fall of the Soviet Union in conflict with another international principle, which often trumped national uh, self-determination. And that is the principle of territorial integrity. So one principle, national self-determination helped and favored the Armenians. The other principle, territorial integrity favored the Azerbaijanis. And as I said, not only between these two principles, but both, neither side was really willing to compromise. Now, Armenia had won that war in the 1990s. It benefited from the armistice of 1994 that had been brokered by Yeltsin's Russia. But Armenians sadly did not take advantage, maybe as much advantage, maybe they couldn't, of the victorious position that they found themselves to find a solution to the conflict. And they were met by harsh resistance by defeated Azerbaijan. In the meantime, in the last two decades, Azerbaijan grew richer and stronger. It was aided by various allies, most importantly, Erdogan's Turkey, uh, was assisted by the Israeli uh, arms exports of very effective drones, and Azerbaijan, as Salpi mentioned, won the war, the brief war in 2020. The saddest thing, and I'll conclude with this, is that a popular democracy was defeated by a repressive dictatorial state, which is now gloating, which is happy in its humiliation of its democratic neighbor. And not, un not perfectly understandably then, for Armenians all over the world, and particularly in Hayastan, in Armenia, chaos has been followed by despair about the future of our democracy. Ron, only you could have done that in seven minutes. Um, please explain the following. You said that as early as the 1960s and 70s, there were petitions sent to Moscow from the Armenians of Gharapov asking for 
uh, reconstituting this administrative situation and being linked to Armenia. How much of this is cultural affinity and how much of this is social and economic rights and a search for that? You know, we raise the wheat, we send it to Baku, we don't get enough bread back. You know, our kids walk to school and they're punished because they're speaking their language. Um, that and the ensuing issues of security. How much of this was cultural and how much of it was in fact social and political rights? My, my answer to that would be, I would not separate them so drastically. I would see them as feeding into each other. My very first book, The Baku Commune, had a subtitle, Class and Nationality in the Russian Revolution. And what I found was very interestingly how the two reinforce each other. It's not unlike how in the United States, we sometimes confuse social issues or class issues with racial issues. We call ethnicity here race, right? It says more biological or about skin color or something like that. But the two feed each other. And it's, it's not accidental that it, the poor and people of color uh, or of recent immigration or of, of Hispanic language become uh, uh, ghettoized and stigmatized precisely because they're not enjoying all the fruits of a certain culture, of a certain society. And the same was true in Karabakh. Uh, that is, people knew that they what their culture was. They felt vulnerable because they were losing their language. More and more of them were speaking Russian. They chose Russian rather than Azerbaijani. Uh, and they were feeling inferior and put upon by Baku, which was taking a lot of the riches from Karabakh into the Azerbaijan area. So you don't have to separate the two. It's usually expressed culturally, but it so, may in, in its source be social. One last question real quick. The, uh, the issue of security, the, at, the very, at the end of the day, people want to live in peace and secure. The sovereignty issues may be primary, may be secondary, but security is not. How does that reconcile itself in a situation where Gharapagh, what was the Republic of Artsakh, is under the sovereignty of Azerbaijan? Gharapagh was considered partly free. Azerbaijan is clearly an autocracy. How do you deal with issues? How, do, how, does, that, how does one reconcile these two things? With great difficulty, I'm afraid. Armenia today, our little state of Armenia is extraordinarily vulnerable. It's vulnerable from outside and inside. And you know this very well. That is, Azerbaijan is now victorious. It's occupied large parts of Karabakh. Uh, the Russian troops are there, but Russia has proved to be not as dependable as a good faithful ally might be. At the same time, Armenia is incredibly even more than ever dependent on Russia and on Russia as its, its major military ally. So security is a big question. Those are the external factors. What will Russia do? Uh, what will Turkey do? What will Azerbaijan do? Internally, Armenia is even more seriously threatened. There's real doubt now about the leadership in Armenia, about whether or not we can maintain a democracy as well, which of course is a real danger. Hopefully we'll have some election soon and that question will be at least in some way resolved. Thank you, Professor Ron Suni. I hate to cut you off, but I'm going to do it. I apologize and I thank you very much for, for participating. My pleasure. Um, with this context, I'm now going to invite the three guests who are going to participate in the very first panel. Ambassador Nina Hachigian is Deputy Mayor of Los Angeles for International Affairs. Prior to that, Ambassador Hachigian served as the second U.S. Ambassador to the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, ASEAN, which has taken on increasing importance for the United States. Professor Hannah Gary is Director of the International Human Rights Clinic here at the USC Gould School of Law, where she teaches. Her work focuses on international criminal law, refugee law, and human rights. She has worked in several international criminal tribunals, including the former, the tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, for Rwanda, and in the extraordinary chambers in the courts of Cambodia. And Arev Hovsepian is a second year student at USC Gould School of Law, where she heads the Armenian Law Students Association. And she works in Professor Gary's Human Rights Clinic and was very active in bringing attention to the rights of victims during the Arapa War. I want to thank all three of you and I know that Nina Hachigan is under time constraints, so I will try to move this as quickly as I can, but I really do want to start with Arev. Arev, you're the generation and the professional 
the one who was chosen to, you know, fix the world, right wrongs, you've, you've chosen that profession. What has this conflict taught you about the world and your profession? Thank you. Thank you, Salpi, and thank you for having me. Um, to, to be honest, it has been an almost surreal experience to be a law student learning about international law and institutions which aim to protect human rights and promote peace and security. And while learning all of this, simultaneously watching these entities and systems completely fail in protecting the people of Atsab. In my specific experience during the war, I happened to be enrolled in the International Human Rights Course and was learning about treaty bodies, about the UN and its organs. And unfortunately, because so much of international law and institutional enforcement is based on the consent of states, this war really called into question what does this mean for Artsakh and its people? If much of the international community and the relevant institutions view Artsakh as being within the borders of Azerbaijan, which means that the Azeri government must consent to institutional involvement in that area, who is protecting the people of Artsakh? Their well being and their lives are then completely at the mercy of the Azeri government which was the very entity that was attacking civilians with drone strikes, beheading them and mutilating bodies, kidnapping and torturing prisoners of war, and has done so with complete impunity, with no interference or any consequences enforced by the international community. And this seems to be the way of the 20th and 21st centuries. Huh? The state does what the state can and the world yeah. watches. Essentially, yes. and. You know, you, you sort of hear the reasoning or the excuse of, well, you know, the international community is not infringing out of respect for Azerbaijan's territorial integrity. But that, that's at the cost of tens of thousands of lives. And the legal status of those in Artsakh shouldn't even be a factor. Whether these civilians were living in Artsakh or in the capital of Azerbaijan or in Armenia, it doesn't matter because their fundamental human rights need to be protected. And this has unfortunately just not been the priority of the relevant international institutions. Nina, another, dim another dimension to this is- Audit, Hang called, on one second. Let me, let me, get, get, let me ask uh, Deputy Mayor Nina Hachigan to, to step in. Nina, this is the war that we're calling the war that came to Los Angeles. How often does this happen in your job? Uh, it, you know, it does come up. Um, LA has had such a, has, just this incredible wealth of diaspora populations. It's one of our greatest strengths that we are 60% immigrants or children of immigrants. And many of these populations are huge. Uh, we're home to the largest global population of Mexican, Korean, Vietnamese, Iranian, foreign born communities. Uh, I don't, I hope, I think that we are also the largest concentration of Armenians, but I, I have to check on Moscow. That was the one that we weren't sure. Russia, might... as Russia altogether, yes, Russia has more than the United States, but as a city, I think LA has more than I Moscow. Think I think you're right about that. In any case, because many residents are newly arrived and uh, concentrated, that means that they, you know, their communities here are very tied to their home country and attuned to what's happening there. So right now, as you mentioned, there's a lot of distress in the Myanmar, you know, Burmese community over the coup by the military and the terrible violence that they're using against these widespread uh, peaceful demonstrators. Um, that doesn't create inter-community tension because it's an internal conflict essentially, but it creates a lot of distress and trauma. Um, a couple of years ago, when tensions between Japan and Korea were at their height, uh, we had to navigate some uh, issues around depictions of the so-called comfort women, the sexual slaves that Japan used in World War II. And of course, that was a, an incredibly um, uh, lightning rod issue uh, and between the two countries themselves. And then most recently, um, as we're talking about, you know, the war between Armenia and Azerbaijan, which was just so uh, heart-wrenching for the American Armenian community here, bringing up uh, past trauma, you know, current trauma for just about every member of the community. And I know you're going to talk about that in the next panel. Um, it did spill over into some skirmishes outside the Azerbaijani consulate. 
Um, and it was the cause of an incredible march that brought, you know, 100,000 Armenians and their friends to the streets. I, I was part of it and saw that there were BLM protesters for, for Artsakh and there were uh, Mexican for Armenian uh, signs. And I thought, you know, only in LA. <laughs> Well, it's, it's, you know, that was the same reaction we had with the uh, request for proposals here at SC for DEI week, that it's only in LA, I think, that all of this comes home to you, that the struggles are universal. People are looking for respect and for understanding and for inclusion. I really and like the way you framed it at the top, Sophie. I thought that was really, uh, really uh, interesting and, and correct. Well, I appreciate it. I think what I'm going to ask Hannah and, and you, back to you as well, Nina and Adev is, you know, Hannah, you run a human rights clinic in a world where human rights law is, is really without the instruments of serious enforcement or implementation capacity. Obviously, that's my statement. Is that fair? Are there tools? What are your tools? How do all of us looking for that same thing in different places and different capacities how do we find it when the tools don't seem to be there for the populations? So um, in answer to your question, Selby, I think um, it is a fair critique in some ways and I want to address that more specifically. But before I do so, I just would like to start off and uh, by acknowledging as I did in public statements with the assistance of Arev in the clinic and drafting those, uh, to, uh, and also from the clinic, but also from USC Gould's faculty, there was a large representation and we made a statement in the midst of the height of the violence this past fall, um, just to express my solidarity with all of the communities and the families here in the United States and also in the region that were impacted by the 45 days of violence, extreme violence. I know it was terrifying and traumatizing for the diaspora communities and to really watch what was transpiring and to feel so helpless uh, in the face of what was happening. And I just wanna stop and acknowledge that. It is so frustrating. And I know that that's what's driving this question. Exactly. <laughs> and I, I am not Armenian, but I, you know, I empathize. And I, if I were in your shoes uh, uh, and part of the, the community, I can only imagine how horrifying it is still in the aftermath, even though the conflict has died down. And, um, you know, the reason I do work as a, as a teacher, as a mentor in international human rights is because I still do believe in, in the tools that we do have. And I do think that increasingly um, there have been uh, creative ways that there have been more implementation and enforcement mechanisms created, largely driven by civil society and by communities coming together who have, who are all, as you, as you noted, Nina, all, you know, in some way or another victims of uh, uh, exclusion and discrimination, um, the theme of this panel and inequality, right? And I think that increasingly um, the use of these mechanisms and their effectiveness really hinges upon the willingness and the ability of groups to come together, these, these different survivor communities coming together to really, uh, you know, creatively and actively put pressure on states through them. And, and what we have learned, um, I'm just gonna jump ahead because I know we're short on time, but what we have learned in the clinic in, um, in some of the work we've been doing around Cameroon, another forgotten conflict that's been overlooked and that um, is in somewhat of a frozen state, if you will, because of large, powerful geopolitical and economic interests in West Africa is that um, advocacy is it requires so much persistence and so much creativity with regard to using mechanisms at the UN level and then mechanisms that are available bilaterally, you know, with regard to the relevant states um, and pressuring them within their national systems and the tools that are available there. And, and then, you know, doing that constantly and, and timing really matters. And then going back and, and, and then also thinking about what can be done in the short term, but then also what needs to be done in the long term um, in terms of transitional justice. I think Ron laid out so beautifully the competing interests here under international law of territorial integrity and self-determination. And this, this recent eruption of violence, right, is, is part of a long continuum and it's rooted in empire and it's rooted in, in a failure 
to for the international community to come together and to resolve the situation. There, I can talk specifics about the different types of mechanisms, but I, I want to stop and, and give you a chance to. No, I appreciate it, and you you know you put it in the in the global context that I think we just need to keep hearing and hearing that at the end of the day, all these groups together need to form uh, their own mechanisms to influence policy. There, and 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 this is you know this is I think Deputy Mayor. Hutch again, I think this is where, in fact, the bottom up does work, right? I mean, the state has to be um, accountable. Yeah, I think you're right. And I, I do think um, that that regular people in civil society are not powerless. They're, they're, they are a lot more powerful than they used to be. And I've seen, you know, all kinds of examples of domestic campaigns of uh, to take down um, uh, you know, uh, figures that, that uh, I was just thinking about the, the TikTok campaign uh, to, um, to sign up to be, to be at, a, at, at a Trump rally, uh, but not actually go, like that kind of thing. And there's also, you know, various cyber hacking groups that are, you know, kind of righteous cyber hacking groups. Uh, so I don't, so we, we're seeing examples. I don't know to what degree they've been tried or, or implemented in terms of Armenia and Azerbaijan, but there, you know, th those tools didn't used to exist. Um, we used to only have Amnesty International, like they write our letters and that was, you know, that was effective too, to some degree, but. Yeah, uh, and another time, yeah. Adev, um, Nina is speaking about the non-institutional ways of trying to impact policy and change. What have you discovered now in these several months of you know, working with institutions, starting with the university and all the way to international courts and how they work? What have you discovered about how global institutions work in the 21st century? Sure. Um, I think, I mean, again, going back to, to what I was saying earlier, I think that much of it is unfortunately, I mean, based on the concept of state's consent. Uh, one that I've been following rather closely is UNESCO, which is the entity which aims to protect and preserve world heritage, but they do not conduct missions in a given area without the government's consent. And so in this case, while there are now countless of ancient Armenian churches, monuments, and cultural sites that are now under the control of the Azeri military, UNESCO cannot effectively document and take inventory of these sites because the Azeri government has not allowed for it. And as a result, over these last few months, many of these monuments in Artsakh have already been destroyed. And unfortunately, there has been no consequences. I mean, on, to the contrary, the vice president of Azerbaijan was designated as, and still serves as, a UNESCO goodwill ambassador for culture. So, I mean, where is, is the accountability for actions of this sort? And how can governments who behave in this way not only avoid consequences, but be rewarded by the international community? So I think the issue of framing is really important as well, and identifying an aggressor and behaving accordingly. So. Professor Gary, this comes back to, to you in the sense that you're the legal scholar and I'm going to ask you kind of a political question and that is, you know, to how, how much of the resolution of these sorts of conflicts uh, rely on legal instruments and how much is really a function of political work? Great question. Um, I think here, uh, and before I answer that, I just want to mention something that uh, dovetails on what Arav was saying with regard to cultural rights. I was doing a little, you know, I actually put together, I did a little brainstorming as I put my attorney hat, hat on last night and I was going through all the UN mechanisms and coming up with like a plan of action if I were to put together a campaign with civil society to use these mechanisms. And one thing I noted that there's, there's special procedures mechanisms at the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights in Geneva. And there are, there are individuals who have special mandates, right? And are invited into countries to do fact-finding and report writing 
uh, special rapporteurs. And both Armenia and Azerbaijan have given standing invitations. Now, whether those still <laughs> exist or not, and whether they would give access at this point in time is another question. But there's a special rapporteur on uh, cultural rights. So if I were in, you know, working, and we are thinking about doing this in the clinic and moving forward, I would, first thing I would do is write and give a detailed factual analysis of all of the destruction of cultural property that has happened in the, in the 45 days this past fall and get that in front of the special rapporteur and demand that the special rapporteur start making more statements about that and ask them to go and do a report specifically on this particular conflict if they haven't done so already. Um, but in answer to your question, Selby, I think, you know, here we're talking about a conflict in, in the midst of which in 45 days, there were international crimes perpetrated, right? These were serious human rights abuses that rise to the level of an international crime. There, there is possibly, you know, there, there was a genocide alert put out. Uh, clearly there is uh, in evidence of genocidal intent with what happened here. Um, and then we have war crimes at issue um, and with regard to how civilians were targeted and with regard to how prisoners of war have been treated. These are so serious under international law that the only proper response is a legal response, international criminal justice. Now, how you affect that is very difficult, right? Obviously, politically in this situation. And I think for resolution of this particular crisis, it, it requires a transitional justice response long term, but in the short term, there has to be um, political pressure and there has to be, you know, things like targeted sanctions with regard to all parties involved here, uh, all countries and, and, and senior leaders through targeted sanctions, putting pressure on them um, to um, allow for access, allow for fact finding, to allow for investigation, and, and then you know, civil society in the face of the fact that there is no real political prospect at the moment of setting up a tribunal or this going to the International Criminal Court, it's not possible, um, thinking about ways in which we can uh, preserve evidence and collect evidence and get it ready for case files to eventually in, in some hopeful future, uh, for there to be prosecution, because that's what international law demands um, is required. There cannot be impunity for these kinds of acts. And we see alternative mechanisms being set up to gather this kind of evidence and build case files for Syria, another intractable you know, situation where Russia is involved and there's no political solution immediately available at, through the United Nations because of Russia's veto. Um, and it's similar, you know, in the region here. And so we have to, as human rights organizations and civil society, do what we can in the face of that using mechanisms like the General Assembly or the Human Rights Council to get around the deadlock at the Security Council. Well, okay, that's a perfect opener too, especially since you mentioned Syria. Um, at the end of the day, and Nina Hachigan, Ambassador Hachigan in this context, the fact that so many of these issues are bilateral perhaps trilateral issues, yet their resolution often relies on all of the other triangulations that, that countries and states have with each other, right? So Russia and Turkey have all sorts of calculations, for example, in the Caucasus, in Syria, uh, and elsewhere, just bilaterally, energy and so many other issues. So even as we, we as, as human beings looking for justice, try to pursue some of the mechanisms that Professor Gary is mentioning. At the end of the day, the political resolution really isn't a linear path, is it? It's all of these other political machinations we need to live with it. Yeah, I think that's right. But that doesn't take away from the importance of the kind of work that Professor Gary is saying that needs to happen. Because I do think, um, first of all, it's just justice you know, eventually served, even if a decade from now. And second of all, to the degree that the, like the International Criminal Court becomes um, more active, more effective, faster, that can provide a potential, you know, point of uh, accountability, in, you know, over the long run. Like you need to, you need to work and exercise these institutions in order for them to get stronger, which is the same reason that the, that the United States is going to join the Human Rights Council, even though it's, you know, kind of a joke in some ways, given the membership, um, but we can't affect it from the outside, right? We can only we can only affect it from the inside if we're part of it, if we're working on it. Um, uh, and so, you know, President Trump took us out of it, but uh, this administration is going to, you know, is going to appeal to to reengage with it. And 
um, you know, I do believe over the long term that we can, we can, these institutions can get stronger. I mean, it, they're not that old, you know, they, and they need uh, to be taken seriously. Um, and actually, sadly, it's often the United States um, that is the one that, uh, you know, wants to, you know, believes that somehow these institutions are um, affecting our own sovereignty, which is, I always think ridiculous, but there is a small but mighty, you know, black helicopter crowd uh, in our in the U.S. Congress that thinks, you know, we 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 want no part of these multilateral institutions. Um, I will just say, you know, in closing, or, or because I do have to go pretty soon, is that I'm um, hopeful about the Biden administration. You know, there's always going to be compromises when it comes to human rights. I mean, China right now is committing a genocide against the Uyghurs. Um, but we're going to talk to China about climate, uh, you know, or I hope we will, uh, and I'm sure we will. Um, you know, China has not been terrible on the Myanmar issue. They actually signed on to a UN Security Council resolution that was pretty tough uh, yesterday, the day before. Um, so, and yet they're committing a genocide. So it's all, you know, there, it's all this terrible gray area when it comes to geopolitics and human rights. But what the Biden administration at least will do is always be asking the question, always be putting the issue first, always saying what needs to be said. And even that is important, you know, when the US president or the US secretary of state or the national security advisor, you know, calls out uh, the, the coup leaders in Myanmar, for example, uh, that gives solace to the people there to some degree, like they're, they're hearing, they're listening. And so it isn't perfect, but it's, it's better than what we've had. Yeah, the giving solace part is so very important because the world is what it is and everybody can see what happens elsewhere. It's just very hard to understand that once you see it, you can't necessarily act on it. And even if you can't, that the if the hegemons can't, you know, if the United States can't, then 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 where are we? I know you're in a hurry and I want to thank you for participating. My great pleasure. Thank you. Um, so even though uh, Ambassador Nina Hachigan is leaving us, we're going to continue a little bit more before we start our second panel. And um, Professor Gary, Adiv, you know, this is cynical salty kicking in here in that, you know, we look at the United States and the European Union who were essentially missing in action huh, in, this, in this conflict. Even as NATO's second largest power, Turkey, decided that it was okay to use these uh, armaments that now almost come without responsibility. Unfortunately, they also seem to come without accountability, but certainly without responsibility. It's not hand-to-hand -hand combat. You can very cleanly clean out a civilian population, not even a military target. And at the end of the day, all of the human rights, democracy conversation that the Western values that the US and the EU try to inculcate suddenly weren't important enough mechanisms, tools, levers to make it possible for any sort of intervention, which of course then leads me to the cynical part. And that is that, are these really just levers for third countries to intervene for, so, uh, for economic or political engagement. You know, the US says we will engage with Armenia if it meets certain democratic standards at the end of the day when fundamental democracy and human rights are missing, both in Armenia and in Azerbaijan. I mean, Armenia sometimes, Azerbaijan often. They're, they're not there to protect the values for their own sake. Now, that was a long about way of expressing my cynicism. Professor Gary, Adiv, what do you think? And where do your instruments come in so that uh, they are in fact held accountable? Arab, do you wanna go take a stab? Sure, I mean, I, I, was, I was gonna bring up, I think the issue of framing is, is very important here as well. Um, and part of the reason for why I think the West was sort of silent and didn't, really do anything, unfortunately, to help the situation. Um, something that was, was really disappointing and that I saw perpetuated by the media, by international institutions, and by other governments was this narrative that this conflict was essentially just a war between two countries fighting over a piece of land with no clear aggressor, 
both sides are accusing one another of violating the ceasefire and sort of just leaving it at that, that the two sides are pointing fingers at one another. And I think that's hugely problematic because when that is done, you are failing to, I, to correctly identify the aggressor and hold it responsible for triggering the situation. And I think that the international community's failure to do so essentially allowed for tens of thousands to be killed and hundreds of thousands to be displaced and really enabled this sort of aggressive behavior. So I, I think this issue of framing is very, very important and calling it what it is and placing it in context that it was not just a battle over a piece of land. It's actually part of a very calculated effort, a larger campaign essentially accompanied by genocidal rhetoric that the Turkish and Azeri governments have been using for years. I mean, the, the president of Azerbaijan has called Armenians, our enemies are Armenians of the world, not of Artsakh, not of Armenia, but of the world. I mean, this is genocidal rhetoric. And even though Azerbaijan has made its intent very clear, somehow the international community has still questioned it. So I think even just starting from the bottom up, educating the general public about the, the historical context and the genocidal rhetoric that is coming from the highest levels of these governments is really, really important. Hannah, you get the last word and, and you know, I'm, I'm going to rephrase the same cynical question. Thank you, Arif. Um, Hannah, you get the last word because I think there's the space between the cynical and the hopeful. You know, I, we're all looking for a prescription in a world where everyone really wants the same thing, you know, respect, basic security and safety, understanding, inclusion, equitable opportunities. And at the same time, Mike's, might seems to make right and institutional uh, structures don't have the flexibility to in fact do what they purport to do in their missions and value statements. What do we do as scholars? What do we do as citizens of the world? What do we do? So um, I think that, you know, looking at these Western institutions and critiquing them as not being able to be flexible enough to promote and uphold human rights for their own sake, it appears to be that way, right? And, but it is a bit of a simplistic take, right? So internal in these institutions and in governments are people who do care about human rights and who do seek to you know, do what they can from inside to make sure that these institutions and governments uphold human rights for their own sake. I would just say that with regard to this particular conflict and this context and what happened this past fall, it really demonstrates to me how our vote matters in terms of who we elect to be our leaders and where they stand. There are leaders that use human rights and institutions for business and for political gain, right? And it is about um, that and not promoting human rights for their own sake. And it's about selective justice. During the ramp up in Azerbaijan, the US government was funding, happily funding that ramp up right? There was big business to be made, yeah? And there are, you know, interests in keeping uh, geopolitically and locally and keeping this conflict going on indefinitely for there never to be peace because there's big business to be made. And it's important and incumbent upon us who believe in human rights and fight for human rights for their own sake to elect leaders in our own government who, who hold those same values and who will not use human rights for business and political purposes. Uh, so with that, I'll end. I'm, I'm ready to join in. Thank you. Um, you've each contributed, a, I think, a new uh, insight into what continues to be extremely complex and complicated. I recently spoke to a, a, a negotiator in the Radapak process over all these years, and he said, the farther away we are, the simpler a resolution looks, um, and yet it isn't for the many reasons that you've all laid out. So thank you, Arev Hovsepian. Thank you, Professor Hannah Gary. Thank you to Deputy Mayor Nina Hachigian, and thank you, Professor Ron Suni.
um, we're going to move on to the second half of this conversation about recycled trauma and diasporan identity and this war that came to Los Angeles. And so I want to invite my colleague, Deputy Director of the Institute of Armenian Studies, Shushan Garabedian, to lead the second panel. Shushan, welcome. Thank you, Salpi. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to part two of this morning's panel entitled The War That Reached Los Angeles, Human Rights, Recycled Trauma, and Diaspora Identity. In the spirit of tackling challenging questions and difficult conversations, we will enrich our toolkits with topics such as the impact of trauma on mental health, particularly the role of intergenerational trauma in the experience of war and how that shapes diasporic identities. What happens to a collective, a people who have experienced deep historical trauma, an attempt at erasure, a trauma that has served as a point of rupture, as some historians have assessed the catastrophe which has served as an equalizer or cornerstone of transnational identity in a diasporic population that's spread across the world. What happens to this collective when they face a new trauma, seemingly almost every generation, the most recent including war, and then war again in the span of 30 years? A war which not only includes rhetoric, like Adev mentioned, channeling the original cataclysmic trauma, but also like Professor Suni mentioned, is using the frame or lens of the initial trauma to comprehend the current atrocities. What happens when a nation is thrust into existential angst in an era where new technologies and channels of communication bring the horrors of human rights violation to a phone screen? What happens when a parallel war, now one of information or some would say misinformation, is launched on social media platforms? What happens when a new generation of diasporans who perhaps were not engaged or invested in their identity are now awakened and impacted even though they may not have family or friends who are directly impacted by the war? The, the fundamental question we're trying to answer is how can a war so far away taking place thousands of miles away in an unknown part of the world takes such a traumatic toll on folks in Los Angeles. What does this do to notions of identity? How does this impact one's sense of well-being, one sense of community, trust in institutions that shape one's life, as we just heard? How do people cope with trauma? And why should we care? What can others in the community, near and far, do to support those experiencing trauma of all kinds? These are some of the questions and goals of this discussion. And I'd like to welcome the panelists, Professor Beth Meyerwitz, Professor Lilith Keshishan, and um, law school student Maral Tavitian here at USC Gould to discuss these issues with me. So I'm going to start with um, Maral Tavitian. Maral, what does it feel like to be a law student in one of the most prestigious academic institutions in the world? grooming you and your peers to be future leaders and change makers, studying international law and issues of human rights while witnessing a year's worth of human rights violations in this country and around the world. And in the fall, coming home to you as you watch the Harabakh war break out. I know from your previous work, you've lived there, you've worked there, you've interacted with people there. How, how have you been dealing with this I don't know what to call it, cognitive dissonance experience. What has been your experience? Uh, thank you, Dr. Garabetian. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be a part of this discussion. Um, and thank you for that question. I think if I had to describe the feeling of being a law student throughout the days of the war, I would say that what I perceived as kind of the invisibility of the people of Artsakh on the world stage as citizens of an unrecognized state, was mirrored in many ways by um, my own feeling of invisibility as a student in the institutions that I am a part of. Um, and what do I mean by that? You mentioned in your introduction how this war really hit home for all of us. And I can't emphasize enough just how personal of an experience this was. Um, my friends in Armenia were drafted, some of them were drafted to the front lines to fight. Others, uh, former colleagues, went to the heart of the conflict to cover it as journalists. 
And um, in the United States, multiple American Armenian friends actually lost family members um, throughout the course of the fighting. And so this was really a daily experience of, I would say emotional distress and just um, very raw feelings throughout the, the conflict. And as I reached out to the, to the law school and to the broader university to kind of amplify um, what was going on and, and validate the experiences that I and my, my Armenian peers were, were going through, um, I felt that, that the response of the institution did not meet the gravity of what we were experiencing. And um, to speak more specifically about, you know, kind of the dynamics of being a law student, I was enrolled in an international human rights law course, actually with Arev, as she mentioned um, earlier. And to be studying human rights through a theoretical lens, um, reading treaty bodies about the protection of indigenous peoples, um, reading documents like the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, um, which entitles all human beings to the same rights, irrespective of race, nationality, any distinguishing factors to be reading those texts while at the same time watching rampant human rights violations be committed against the indigenous Armenian population of the Republic of Artsakh um, and watching war crimes documented in real time in great detail on social media and feeling effectively powerless as a law student, as an advocate to um, stop these atrocities from occurring, even as I and my peers appealed to the international institutions responsible for protecting human rights. Um, and as we appealed within our own university to uh, recognize what was going on and to express solidarity, I think that kind of um, showed me in a lot of ways how these institutions have failed um, the, the communities that, the, that they should be protecting. Um, and so it's, it's caused a lot of reflection about how um, we can ensure like something like the war in Artsakh does not happen again. And when other communities at USC, um, my peers experience similar situations, how um, the university can better support, um, support them through the, the emotional and psychological toll that um, conflicts take. Thank you, Marad. and. Um, I think this is a perfect segue to turn to Dr. Meyerowitz. Um, Dr. Meyerowitz, you've studied psychological reactions, namely trauma and resilience among survivors of highly stressful situations, be it serious illness diagnoses or genocide. Um, you know, the sense of powerlessness that Maral was talking about and this kind of grave sense of loss. How... Uh, can you explain, you know, we use words like intergenerational trauma, transgenerational trauma, historical collective trauma. Can you explain what that actually is and how it manifests itself? Is it parents socializing children through the, their own trauma or the stories they tell? Is it epigenetics? How does it express itself? And, you know, is it a real thing? I'm sure people wonder. Yeah. So. Absolutely, it's a real thing. Um, and I want to say, before even talking about historical or intergenerational trauma, that we are talking also about trauma that's occurring right here, right now, in this moment. And that is on top of, in addition to, the, histor the historical background in which this is occurring. So the idea of historical trauma, intergenerational trauma, just to set the stage, intergenerational trauma it basically is the idea of contagion of traumatic experience across generations. So that one generation doesn't have to actually experience the traumatic event in order to have the effects of that. Uh, how that happens is a question of controversy in the field, but right now we think it's multi-determined, that it can happen through parenting, it can happen through those same traumatic events continuing on, it can happen through uh, intrauterine stress hormones, it can happen through epigenetics. So there are a lot of ways that that can happen. Often intergenerational trauma is a result of poverty, sexual abuse, other things that occur within the family. 
Historical trauma, though, is intergenerational trauma that's experienced over time and across generations by a whole group that has a shared identity. It was first noticed by a psychiatrist, or first written about in the scholarly literature, by a psychiatrist who over 50 years ago noticed that the children of Holocaust survivors living in Canada had far more um, psychological distress than other children. Why would that be? You know, why they're living in Canada, they didn't go through the Holocaust, they weren't, didn't go through the stresses of immigration. And so they started to notice this historical transmission. And since then, the similar phenomenon has been observed in many communities with a history of being subjected to long-term intense trauma or on a massive scale. And this goes back to the point that many folks have been making on these panels about this is not unique to one community. This is an experience that we share, many communities share, and can really, and is a point of attachment to other communities, this sense of historical trauma. So it's been noticed in the Native American communities, in African American communities, many other communities. Uh, responses can continue even generations after the original trauma occurred. But in the absence of additional traumatizing events, the responses tend to tend to uh, fade with each passing generation, but with continued traumatic events. No, that's not what you see. You see an exacerbation. Um, the answer to your question of how it manifests itself isn't an easy one. Um, and we've already heard some really important examples, a sense of invisibility, a sense of powerlessness. Um, in some cases, the reactions can be linked directly to the traumatic events. So maybe people might experience nightmares that relate to what you've been, what one's seeing in the news, maybe hoarding food, maybe intrusive thoughts that pop up at times when you don't want them to, avoidance of certain situations or emotions. And in other cases, the reactions are more general responses to traumatic, which can be an emotional numbing um, or, on the other side of that same coin is being over emotional. But in general sense, taken together, historical trauma is marked by a sense of living in survival mode. So always being in that sense of protecting survival. Um, and it can involve a sense of distrust of the world, a belief that the world isn't really a safe place, that you can't count on, the institutions that are supposed to protect you betray you, the sense of institutional betrayal that Arnold was just describing very, very uh, poignantly, that something bad could happen at any moment. And this plays itself out sometimes in overprotectiveness, being overprotective of one's children and sometimes being overprotective of one's parents. Um, a sense of survivor's guilt, a sense as we look at the news thinking, uh, I don't deserve this. Look at what other people are going through, a sense of being undeserving, a deep hurt and pain, a sense of unresolved grief, of longing for what's been lost, a sense that the world feels dangerous. But the shared stress of historical trauma this legacy of trauma can also lead to more empathy for others and can lead to a greater understanding of what other mistreated communities have experienced and can lead to, as Professor Gary was pointing out and others, can lead to a strong, deep motivation to take action and to make things right. So I do not want to suggest that this is pathological. It can provide deep motivation to be uh, an active, engaged, empathic citizen of the world, which in time helps overcome this institutional betrayal. Thank you so much. I'm nodding at all of the things you're saying because I think many of us are recognizing it. And I'm so happy you highlighted the kind of shared collective historical trauma. There's a reason in my introduction, it didn't say the Armenian people, right? That this is a collective, and I'm sure so many people who are part of various collectives were nodding in recognition of, you know, how 
this manifests itself and what it means, both in the deep sense of loss, but also in the sense of resilience and in the sense of empathy and desire for change. Um, here, I want to turn to um, Dr. Keshishian. This, uh, the title of this event is inspired actually in part by a piece you authored for um, the Institute's uh, online symposium called Voices on Harabah which invited scholars, artists, thinkers, intellectuals to reflect on what was happening during the war. And you submitted a piece called The Trauma on My Street, where you really eloquently and viscerally articulated this ever-present impact of trauma in the context, you know, intergenerational trauma in the context of more recent trauma, just like Professor Meyer was saying that, the, you know, there's the current trauma and then there's a historical trauma that perhaps might inform how that's promised and we'll come back to that. But Dr. Kishishan, you're a faculty member and part of the Institute's team at USC. What can you share or say about your own observations of how the war has impacted students and community members in Los Angeles? Thank you. Um, well, uh, my piece for in my piece for Voices on Garabagh, uh, I recounted an incident where uh, my neighbor was involved in a car accident in uh, front of my house, and that triggered an intense and emotional response um, from her, likely from her experience uh, during the war in Iraq. Uh, and thinking about that made me reflect on the people of various backgrounds living in my neighborhood, my Thai neighbors, my Mexican neighbors, Korean neighbors, my Armenian neighbors. Um, and all the experiences and memories they've brought with them from different parts of the world. Uh, and, you know, in many ways, this is an obvious thing, right? People have pasts, we come from different places, um, but it's something we might not consider on a daily basis and it comes to the forefront in uh, times of crisis. Um, and I think this happened to a certain degree with, with uh, uh, the recent war. Um, it had an Im immense impact on many students, both in and outside uh, of USC and Los Angeles and all across the world. Um, from my personal experiences with talking to students and things that they've shared with me, uh, several students said they were not sleeping. Um, they were having intense anxiety, feeling like they were falling behind in classes. Uh, they were taking classes and working, you know, uh, during the day. And then because the uh, updates were coming in uh, late at night, so they were, they essentially weren't sleeping um, because they were reading the most recent news. Um, a student expressed that she didn't know how to explain uh, her situation to professors um, and uh, the non-Armenian uh, people she had in her life because the war was so far away and she didn't have friends or family in uh, Armenia or, Ar or Artsakh and felt as if um, people weren't understanding why she was so invested and upset about the situation. Um, some students didn't know how to ask for extensions on assignments. Uh, I think, especially you know, at a place like USC where um, students are often overachievers asking for those extensions is already difficult and then again because of the seeming distance of the actual conflict they didn't know how to kind of justify their need for the extensions um i know of a student who flew to armenia to help with humanitarian efforts uh during the day he was collecting organizing and delivering donated material to those impacted by the war and was taking classes at night and i'm not sure when he was sleeping um, and overall, uh, the youth was very involved in fundraising and humanitarian efforts here in Los Angeles and elsewhere, attending protests, fundraising on and offline, keeping up with the news, all of this while working regular jobs and attending school. Um, and I think the immediacy of the need uh, made it really, really difficult for people to put these kinds of things off, right? So you have an existential issue, a life and death situation for a larger community um, of Armenians versus kind of prioritizing classes. And I think the situation with COVID exacerbated some of that, right? When you're taking virtual classes, you're essentially moving from um, taking a class on screen and then instead of, uh, you know, walking down the hallway and going to your other class, you are reading updates, possibly seeing horrific content online and then moving on to another class. Um, 
And that lack of human contact, I think, uh, um, exacerbated the anxiety for for uh, many. Um, and there was no outlet beyond the screen for dealing with the crisis at hand. Uh, I think it becomes all encompassing, um, and maybe we haven't learned uh, the coping mechanisms to address uh, address the emotional distress that comes with this new type of constant exposure uh, with the negative. And I'll come back to that. Thank you for that. Um, Maral, I wanted to turn to you um, as a student in this process. Did your experience during and after the war, and not only in your role as a student, in your role as a diasporan, in your role as an Armenian American, a law student, an activist, an advocate, a friend, uh, how did this experience shape your understanding of truth? and its historical, legal, um, human value. How, how has this shaped how um, you, see, you see the world when it comes to truth? Yeah, I think so much of this conflict for me fundamentally came down to the importance of truth. Um, and, and what do I mean by that? I think that it's impossible to accurately understand the conflict in Artsakh um, and the war that we saw last year without placing it in the historical context of the 1915 Armenian genocide um, committed by the Ottoman Turks and also the history of persecution that Armenians in the South Caucasus um, and in Azerbaijan and Karabakh uh, have experienced. So when I was following the international media coverage about Artsakh and I was reading one article after another that omitted this crucial context and then fundamentally misrepresented the nature of the conflict as you know, simply a battle over a piece of land. When for the Armenian side, this was really um, a battle in many ways for survival as indigenous peoples um, in the region. So reading that coverage, um, I believe amounted in many ways to historical erasure and as an Armenian, uh, historical erasure is quite personal for me. Um, I'm the great granddaughter of genocide survivors. And I watched as you know, my great grandmother who I was lucky enough to know for a few years of my life, she carried the burden of her truth throughout her entire life. Um, and unfortunately the country that she immigrated to, the United States where I was born, um, has not formally recognized the Armenian genocide and has not validated the horrors that she experienced and millions of Armenian families have experienced and now carried, um, and now that kind of history is carried by my generation. Um, and then also on my mother's side, I'm the great granddaughter of a woman from Artsakh and my grandparents were born in Baku, Azerbaijan, where um, Armenians were the subject of pogroms in the late 80s and um, early 90s. So I feel a certain responsibility because that uh, history has not been validated and the truth throughout the, the days of the war was, I believe, kind of rewritten and history repeated itself and yet the coverage did not reflect that repetition of history. Um, I feel a certain responsibility within my community, my law school, um, my network to educate others, my friends, um, my, my fellow students about um, my history and kind of in some ways carry the, the truth forward. And um, I think that responsibility was not so clear to me as it became during the days of the war. Um, and I think that that was the case for, for many of my Armenian peers as well. Thank you, Mara. Um, Dr. Meyerowitz, in regards to talking about kind of recycled trauma and using former traumas like collective or historical traumas as lenses to, promise, uh, to process current traumas, how does that work? Can you speak a little bit more about how former traumas kind of inform the experience of current traumas and what does the lack of recognition or acknowledgement do in this process? Yeah, I, I think that 
the, the lack of recognition is central because what the lack of recognition does is render the current trauma, the historical trauma current. So there really can't be a clear distinction between the historical trauma and the current trauma. And I, we're always talking about it in extremely eloquent terms that when you look at what's happening now, it's very much a continuum with those historical experiences. So it would, so how does, it, it, so that's the lens through which it's reflected. And I think in large part through a sense of worldview that I was mentioned, trying to mention before of how does one see one's place and what the place of one's community in the world is it, is it a safe place? Is it a place where there's respect and understanding of what really happened? Or is there a sense of trying, of, of sort of crazy making like, no, 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 that's not what really happened. It, it, it's just like a little, I study Rwanda, it was just a civil war, it wasn't a genocide. Um, so that, that sense that what you're saying isn't, what, isn't the view that the larger community shares can be very alienating and very angering. And ultimately without a strong sense of community identity can become very um, disempowering. So I, on the other hand, <laughs> it can also lead to a sense of activism, to a sense of connection with others, to a sense of um, commitment to truth and to truth telling. And I, there's, a, there's a construct by, uh, described by a social psychologist called altruism born of suffering. And it's the idea that through suffering, through understanding and empathy and through overcoming in the sense one's own suffering, seeing beyond the individual impact and looking at the larger, the larger meaning of that suffering can lead to great altru altruistic acts. And I, along that line, I just want to mention the Aurora Prize. And which is, an, as I think probably everyone knows, an international humanitarian award recognizing individuals for humanitarian work awarded on behalf of the survivors of the Armenian genocide. And the idea is this is gratitude in action for people who now are helping other people not Armenians, specifically not Armenians, other people who are in need. And that is a real example of a community using its identity to foster and to bring forward that sense of altruism born of suffering. Thank you for that wonderful example. I love that altruism born out of suffering. Um, bringing the conversation back to the 2020 war, this is for, um, Dr. Keshishan, I know this war has been labeled by some military and social science experts as a first of its kind in terms of the technological scape, uh, scope when it comes to the warfare, but also the kind of parallel war um, in regards to the proliferation of information and misinformation, both in terms of traditional and non-traditional media outlets. It just it constantly seemed to me that this war was more viscerally and intimately experienced by the worldwide diaspora thousands of miles away from Gharabagh. Um, can you maybe talk about what role social media and this parallel information war has played on, on students and community members? Um, I think, uh, I mean, there's just a bombardment of information at all times. Um, and I, I wanted to kind of bring in a, a personal example here and um, a student, a younger student, my son. Um, and a few days ago, he's 10 years old. And a few days ago, um, he came up to me teary eyed and he said, mom, I was watching uh, some Armenian music videos and on YouTube. And um, he said, I read the comments against my instruction, of course, I tell him not to read the comments. Um, and he said, there was a lot of stuff written in another language. So I clicked translate and they were really, really bad mom, he said. And 
it, it broke my heart. And of course we had a conversation about it. Um, and this was in a, you know, it was a music video fun and you're seeing kind of uh, internet uh, warfare happening in the comment sections. Um, and I think we really need to think about, you know, we, we know, right, the internet has brought the world and all of its opinions, good and bad into our personal spaces. Um, but how does that watching and sharing impact our identity, our sense of self and one's worldview, especially when uh, a lot of this is being kind of internalized at a young age, right? Um, the next step then becomes potentially participating uh, in that kind of back and forth. Um, so yeah, definitely I think any, most people are on social media, even if they weren't participating in the sharing of information, the educating, um, uh, the blocking of hate comments, all of those things, even if they weren't necessarily participating that way, they were um, it, uh, seeing uh, the information. And that, it, I think, again, the, the, the constant exposure uh, was what was leading to a lot of the distress, um, at least in my students and with the people I know, in including myself. Thank you. We have a question here in the chat, someone asking, and, and I'm going to pose this to Dr. Meyerowitz about, is there such a thing as secondhand trauma? The um, person asks, during the recent Artsakh war, I couldn't look at airplanes in Denver where I, leave, where I live without imagining them as combat drones. A part of me felt survivor's guilt. Another part felt ashamed for living in physical safety yet experiencing drone fears. And this, I, I kind of it alluded to this in the introduction um, that it, this, this whole notion that something happening so far away can have such a deep toll. Um, and one of some of the surprising questions we would get, and I know we've kind of discussed this among um, colleagues and social networks is, well, do you know someone personally impacted in the war? Do you have a family member or a friend? And for some, the answer is yes, but for some, the answer is no. I don't, I'm living in Denver, you know, but I, I can still have these, these kind of physical and psychological reactions. So Dr. Meyerowitz, what would you say to this question? Uh, secondary traumatic stress uh, is absolutely a phenomenon. And, and, and in fact, part of the definition in the of post-traumatic stress disorder is that the person does not have to be the actual uh, target of the traumatic event, that observing that, observing that trauma in uh, someone or some community that you care about absolutely can lead to the same kinds of um, reactions, responses as direct primary traumatic stress. And I think this, this example of seeing, um, thinking of drones when looking at airplanes is just really a perfect example of how that can happen. How that intrusive thoughts, how thoughts about what's going on somewhere else invade your daily life. Um, and I understand the sense of survivor's guilt associated with that, but I'd also like to suggest another way to look at it, which is of deep empathy. And I would guess that people who heard that someone in Denver was worrying, was concerned, was experiencing that in that kind of way, it would take away a little bit of the loneliness, the sense of not of being misunderstood. So it's in a sense a gift. Thank you. Um, I know we're close to running out of time. So I'm going to try to wrap up with a final question for all of our panelists. So please um, uh, jump in as you see fit. Um, you know, we've talked about trauma, how it manifests itself um, at the individual level, at the collective level, current trauma, intergenerational trauma. Um, now the question is, how do we cope with trauma and what is the role of individuals and institutions in supporting community members who are experiencing trauma? So I, I, I pose this to all three of you um, and so feel free to um, take it as you see fit. Sure, um, 
I can respond, I think, specific to the responsibility of this institution, the University of Southern California, in um, supporting its students. I'm an alumna of um, USC undergrad, as are my, my parents and sister, um, and soon to, be, um, soon to be an alumnus of, of the law school. So this institution has um, had a big impact on my life, and I challenge it to act with sincerity and uh, courage to do what is right when students from different communities are reaching out or experiencing situations of injustice. And, um, you know, specific to the example of Artsakh, I don't think that USC um, should speak out. I believe that it is incumbent on USC as the host of the Shoah Foundation, one of the largest um, you know, archivists of genocide survivor testimonies to reach out to its Armenian student population in the aftermath of this war um, and be there to archive the stories of Armenians um, who you know, ex not only experienced trauma, but who witnessed atrocities um, and crimes against humanity. And so that is my challenge to USC. Um, and I believe that this, you know, challenge to act with sincerity and, and courage applies um, in its conduct with um, students from all different communities whenever they're experiencing um, injustice. Thank you, Manand. Dr. Kishan, Dr. Meyerowitz. Um, I echo Mara's sentiments. Um, Dr. Meyerowitz. Um, so I think the broad, a, a broader point along the lines of what Mara was saying is that this is an institution of education and it's the responsibility of us, of, of those of us who are faculty of here and certainly of the administrators here to educate. And one of the things that we've re that I think has really become clear through the discussion of both panels is that historical events uh, mark present day situations. And it's our responsibility to know and to understand the historical trauma that other that our own communities and that other communities have experienced so that we're very well aware and ready to intervene and ready to help when current day traumatic events link back to and tie to those historical traumas. So I think education is really essential. And I'm a psychologist, so I absolutely have to say that there are psychological treatments, there are interventions that are very, very helpful with traumatic stress. That's one of the areas where we really do have psychological interventions that are helpful. And so if somebody is feeling not themselves, feeling like really overwhelmed, unable to come to, to get back to their sense of right normal life, which many of us are at risk of right now. There are interventions for that, there is help for that. Uh, and there are ways to cope and to learn to take that energy and use it in, in a positive way. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to all of the panelists. Um, both in the first part of this program and second, professors Ron Suni, Hannah Gary, Beth Meyerwitz, Lilith Keshishian, Ambassador Nina Hachikian, and law students Maral Tavitian and Arefov Sepian. Um, thank you to our directors, Alpi Razadian, and our team at the Institute of Armenian Studies. Thank you to Provost Charles Zukoski, Associate Provost for Diversity and Inclusion Initiative, Professor Rich, and the team at DEI for this opportunity. We're really honored to be a part of such important programming. We hope that these meaningful dialogues will inspire more difficult and deep conversations about how the lack of diversity, equity, and inclusion often lead to some of the most heinous violations of human rights and the compounding effect that causes uh, in terms of trauma, right? That this may cause um, like you heard in, um, in this panel. And I really love uh, kind of some of the takeaways that we came with that um, when you're experiencing this compounding effect of intergenerational trauma in the face of current trauma, right? If you're constantly in survivor mode, it's tough to thrive when you're busy surviving. Um, but at the same time, I love Dr. Meyerowitz's um, kind of point about increased empathy and altruism as a result of kind of deep suffering. I hope that um, 
those are some of the things that you take away that whichever collective you're a part of and um, whatever stage that experience may be in that one of the beauties of living in a place like Los Angeles, being a part, a part of an institution like USC is that you have all of these opportunities to engage, to listen, to acknowledge, to have these tough conversations and, 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 and relate to folks. And of course, at the core of it is to learn, right? We are absolutely, as Dr. Meyerowitz said, an institution of learning, a prestigious institution of learning and, and the onus is on us. So thank you all for um, participating, both our panelists and the attendees. And for those of you who would like more information on the 2020 Nagorno-Karabakh War, please take a look at the following resources from the USC Institute of Armenian um, Studies. We have had, and as the screen will come up now with some of the resources, but um, so, the, the, the kind of most comprehensive resource um, is the Focus on Karabakh portal on the Institute's website, which is your go-to for everything and anything. If you need a map, if you need a chronology, a timeline, historical context, if you need day-to-day -day updates, you need documents about um, some of the conventions, all of it is available on Focus on Karabakh. The piece that Dr. Keshishian authored uh, is part of an online symposium called Voices on Karabakh, and you can see what kind of the, the academics, intellectuals, thinkers, artists, how they're conceptualizing and reflecting on the recent war. Um, we also have a podcast series called After War Before Peace that our director, Salpi Razarian, hosts that looks at this kind of space post-war but pre-peace and all of the pieces that need to be addressed for a, a, a resolution of some kinds. So feel free to check these out. Um, they're very good, they're very accessible. And thank you everyone once again for participating.